Okay. Bonna tells me it's 9.59. <laughs> so it's almost 10 o'clock. So um, welcome to worship and we will ring the bell and um, then prepare our hearts for worship. And uh, we're going to have musical prelude this morning. So, which will be wonderful, I'm sure. Thank you to all those who are singing with our choir chorus, whatever the right term is. That was lovely to have that music to begin our worship today. We begin our service with the confession and forgiveness. I invite the congregation to stand as you are able. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who greets us in this and every season, whose word never fails, whose promise is sure. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of our neighbors. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned. We have hurt our community. We have squandered your blessings. We have hoarded your bounty. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy. Righteous God, we confess that we have sinned. We have failed to be honest. We have lacked the courage to speak. We have spoken falsely. In the name of Jesus, forgive us and grant us your mercy.
God is a cup of cold water when we thirst. God offers boundless grace when we fail. Claim the gift of God's mercy. You are freed and forgiven in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening in hymn is all people that on earth do dwell. It's number 883 for those that might be on Zoom and using a book at home. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, our savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Our first reading today is from Exodus chapter 19. The Israelites had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagle's wings, and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses summoned the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is Psalm 100. We will read it responsively beginning with the antiphon. We are God's people and, and the sheep of God's, God's pasture. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with a song. Know that the Lord is God, our maker to whom we belong. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. We, we are, are God's, God's people, people and the sheep of God's, God's pasture. Enter the gates <coughs> of the Lord with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's holy name. Good indeed is the Lord, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from age to age. We, we are, are God's, God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Our second reading today is from Romans chapter five. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to his grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still, while we still were sinners, Christ died for us. Word of God, word of life. 
Thanks be to God. Gospel according to Matthew from chapters 9 and 10. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send our, out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother, Andrew. James, son of Jebedee, Zebedee, and his brother, John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12, Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff, for laborers deserve their food. Whatever town or village you enter, find out who in it is worthy and stay there until you leave. As you enter the house, greet it. If the house is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it is not worthy, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly, I tell you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them for they will hand you over to councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before governors and kings because of me as a testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not for you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death 
and a father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly, I tell you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who through baptism anoints us for ministry, that we may share God's compassion with our needy world, that we may heal the sick and share our bread with the hungry and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Ron, this part's not on your paper. <laughs> Phyllis said to me before worship, don't worry, God will give you the words. <laughs> and, and there are words, I have them in front of me. But I've, you know, and we just read that text and it's, Jesus sent us out for not a fun time. I mean, come on, we're gonna be flogged and dragged before the council and the governors and doesn't sound like something we want to sign up for, does it? And I will tell you that this past few days, I have felt like all of those words. It's the kind of week I've had. So those words are from God, Phyllis. <laughs> um, so hopefully there is something in this message that I um, was challenged to put together yesterday that will speak to you this morning about God's amazing good news. We're at the beginning of three days when in our nation we lift up special things. Today is Father's Day and happy Father's Day to all of you who are fathers. But it's also Father's Day when we're remembered if we've lost our fathers. And maybe it doesn't feel like a happy day. We may be having a sad day. Or maybe we wished to be a father and we have not had that opportunity. But maybe there are other children in our lives that we have been a father image to. So today's a day when we think about fathers including I think we need to think about that God is our father. Tomorrow, our nation celebrates Juneteenth. Got an email that's yesterday from Zion's church secretary reminding us the office will be closed on Monday and I went, oh yeah, it's that new federal holiday, Juneteenth a day set aside in recognition of the June 19th, 1865 day, when finally all enslaved black people in the state of Texas were freed by an executive order. All of the other enslaved black people had been freed before that. The Emancipation Proclamation was almost two and a half years before Texas was the last place. It's a day, some say, for our nation to mark our second Independence Day, because it was a day that was to truly make all people in this nation independent and free. I suspect Jesus, who had compassion on the harassed and the helpless, would have shouted, praise the Lord, when President Biden signed the law to create Juneteenth as a federal holiday. As we go through the day tomorrow, even if it means you've gotten an extra vacation day 
let's remember the true reason for the holiday, not just focus on yippee, I don't have to work today. Tuesday is World Refugee Day. And we are part of a faith community that is truly believing in supporting refugees. The ELCA and Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services has invited all of its members to do a day of advocacy on Tuesday. Reach out to your legislative leaders, write them an email, whatever, to encourage them to see how urgent it is for us to give support for refugees, immigrants, and asylum seekers. In her World Refugee Day letter, Bishop Elizabeth Eaton reminds us that while the United States has been a global leader in refugee resettlement, as close in our area as the refugee resettlement facility in Utica, there is still a lot more to do. About a year ago, the United Nations estimated the displaced persons in the world was no longer 89.3 million, but rather 103 million. That was last year. I suspect the number's higher now. Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services is the largest faith-based nonprofit in the United States dedicated to serving the refugee population. Take some time to learn what it is they do. They help to fund the center in Utica, which I lived here for about 15 years before I knew that. It's not a well publicized thing that part of their programs are funded by Lutherans. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. It's God's harvest, not our harvest. Think about that statement. I was thinking about it this week and, and I thought about all the times when we see requests for help. In the time of those disciples, the need was great. There were widows and orphans and plenty of people that needed that healing Jesus sent his disciples out to offer. That hasn't changed. I suspect there are even more needs today. And even more people seeking safety and escape from persecution. And the ability to live out that inherent dignity that God, our creator, intends for all people. I thought about those times too, when I, and probably some of you, said things like, oh, we can't do that. It's a great idea, but we can't do that. There's not enough people to help. We don't have enough money. We can't do that. In my little village of New York Mills, for at least the last year or more, on their digital sign of what's happening, there has been a plea for volunteer firefighters. The picture changes, the wording changes, but at bottom line, we need firefighters. My little one mile by half mile village responds to about 13 to 1400 calls a year. They need help. My 75 year old neighbor is one of their most deployed EMTs. All kinds of organizations need laborers to help with the harvest. And yet needs also get met, don't they? When hungry people show up at food pantries, there's some kind of food that a volunteer has thought to hand to them. 
when one of us goes to the hospital and needs blood, somehow their blood is there, even though the Red Cross is desperately trying to get blood donors every single day. This is the kind of thing that Jesus summoned his disciples for and sent them out, giving them the authority over unclean spirits and demons and disease and sickness. And he called them by name. These were not just followers that happened to show up when Jesus was talking on this street corner or on a mountaintop. These are people he specifically said, I want you and you. And he gave, called them their names. The harvest is plentiful, the laborers few. Only 12 disciples were commissioned by Jesus and sent out to go to the lost sheep of Israel. They were called into mission and sent, and they went. They didn't say, well, I don't feel good today. I'll go next week. They went. And Jesus' instructions were clear to them. I was listening to the Luther Seminary Brainwave podcast, and Caroline Lewis, who's one of the regulars on that podcast, talked about the four aspects of mission that Jesus laid out for his disciples. It wasn't her idea. She referenced Warren Carter, who wrote a commentary sometime in the past about it. But there are good aspects for us to look at. The first thing Jesus lays out for his disciples is the mission arena. Where is it they're supposed to go? to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he wasn't looking for his message to be shared with the Gentiles yet. That comes later. Where is our mission arena? Where are the harassed and the helpless in our community and beyond? Where is it Jesus invites us to show compassion? Is it in places where hungry people are? Is it with a person of different skin color that we meet on the street? That person who only wants equal pay and housing and a chance to maybe raise their family with dignity? Might the arena be refugees seeking a place to resettle? and needing some support to do that. Secondly, Jesus explains to his disciples what their task is. First and foremost, proclaim the good news that the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus is here. God is among us. Share this good news of Jesus Christ. The same good news we've heard in church that we've become a part of through our baptism. And indeed we are to share. He also said, cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leopards, cast out the demons, and do these things without expecting any kind of payment. For the laborers deserve something. You should get, if you're out laboring for God, trust that God will provide a roof for you to sleep under that night, that God will provide a meal. Do we ever decide not to follow through on a new mission idea because we don't have enough money or we lack some other means of support? Support is the third aspect of Jesus' call to mission. Give without payment. Don't expect that remuneration. And then take no gold or silver or copper, no bag for your journey. Don't take two tunics or sandals. Don't even take your staff. Trust that you're not going to trip along the way. 
Matthew's gospel has Jesus pretty much sending his missionaries out with nothing more than God at their side. Having just this past week seen all the baggage that people take on their vacation trips, including myself, this approach seems rather scary to me. I wouldn't even consider going to Colorado without my suitcase and my backpack filled with all those, I gotta be sure I have these things when I get there. It requires a lot of trust that God will provide for us, doesn't it? The early Christians went out and they proclaimed the gospel. They did what Jesus asked them to do and they believed that their prayers would be answered. Jesus says, don't worry, God will provide the words for you through the spirit. These few, these first 12 set out and established the early church and they went out without a suitcase, without traveler's checks, without their credit card, without a backpack full of food. Trusting God would make it happen. How much more can those gifted people sitting in these pews, sitting at home on Zoom, do by following God's call to step out in faith with the resources that we have been gifted by God? And the last mission aspect is what's the impact? If we do what Jesus says, what will be the impact? Why will it matter? Why does it matter if we answer and follow through on Jesus' call to proclaim the gospel in our arena? For the disciples, it would matter because to those who welcomed those disciples, God's peace would be upon them. And to those who didn't welcome them, there would be a day of judgment. What is the impact of our mission work? In receiving food to fill a person's empty stomach, might that person also hear or see the gospel of Jesus Christ through the fact that you donated that food or that you were the one handing the food to them at the food bank? Maybe they too would be called to enter the mission arena. If a congregation or an individual believer responds to Christ's call to go forth, might not our own faith also grow? And maybe we would plant a seed of faith in someone else's heart. Jesus acknowledges that proclaiming the gospel will not be easy. Those he calls to follow him are called indeed to follow in Jesus' very footsteps. Jesus' footsteps led to Calvary. And he tells his disciples, they will be dragged before the council. They will be hated because of Jesus' name and family members will rise up against one another. And any one of those things are things we can see in our own nation today. There are divisions in families, in faith communities. And yet Christ calls us to proclaim his word. It's not going to be a peace-filled journey, folks. At least not the kind of peace we may think of when we think of peace. You know, everything nice and tranquil and quiet security, don't you have to worry if you might get shot when you walk on the street corner or if your children might be victims in school, that there would be order and law and there wouldn't be hostilities between people or between nations like the Ukraine and Russia. But that's not what Jesus says is gonna happen. And Paul reinforces that in his letter to the Romans where he says that there will be suffering, but those justified by faith will have peace with God 
through Jesus Christ, because God's grace is upon us. It's been given to us. And God has given us that through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can be confident that God is with us, that God's love is in our hearts. And that's the kind of peace Jesus is talking about. That peace of knowing that in midst of all the chaos and whatever craziness your life presents to you at this day and week, God is there saying, I'll give you the words. My spirit is there. My love is with you. And I am walking with you. God gives us the ability to go out and follow Jesus into the mission field. To answer the call when Christ asks, will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know and never be the same? Because you won't ever be the same. Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you and you in me? Give thanks for God's love for all people. Proclaiming that love at every single opportunity. We have the good news of Jesus Christ. It's ours to share, and we should indeed make a joyful noise about it. Not whisper it, but shout it from the rooftop. Christ is alive here and now today in this very messy and chaotic world. Amen. Our hymn is In Christ Called to Baptize. Let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the prayers. Lord, we come before you at this time with our request. You say, come, and we come. You say, we'll answer, you will answer, and we wait for your answer. And we praise you. So let us pray together. We come together this morning because we are indeed trusting in God's abundant mercy. So we offer up to our Lord our prayers for a world, O oh Lord, in need. For the church here in Trinity, in the Mohawk Valley, and all around the world, we pray to our God. Seek out disciples, Lord, and send them out with your authority, your Holy Spirit, to proclaim good news, bringing healing of mind, body, and or spirit where there is pain and counter the forces of evil. God, in our mercy, in your mercy, hear our prayer. <clears throat> For the earth and all its creatures, we pray. Equipped farmers, farm workers, and all who labor on the land to produce a harvest, nourish crops with ample rainfall and abundant sunshine. And we pray that also the, the fire in Canada, Lord, uh, would be out completely, Lord, and then replenish the land there. Restore lands ruined by pollution or misuse. God, in your mercy. Hear our hear prayer. For all those who govern, we lift our prayers to you, Lord. Empower those who seek peaceful solutions to conflict and embolden those who advocate for all who are oppressed. Work through systems of government, Lord, to establish your justice throughout the world. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all those who suffer, we pray. Accompany those who feel homeless or helpless who feel alone or abandoned or maybe around people and yet still feel lonely and abandoned. Embrace any who long for successful treatment for mental illness or freedom from addiction. Heal those who are sick. And we especially name before you, Lord, Sandra, Ann, Bob and Tiffany, Larry, Rosemary, Mary, Rosemary, Judy, Rachel and Barbara, Teresa, Bill and Jennifer, Peter and Bo, Michelle, Tanya, Daniel, Irene, and Chase, 
Kim and Tim, Gail, Harry, and Joe, Edith, Charlie, Nancy, Gary, Jeff, Charlene, Joyce, Rick, and Nancy. And those we name out loud at this time or, or in our hearts before you. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Forefathers and grandfathers, great grandfathers, and all father figures that encompasses what I just said. We pray, Lord, console all who long to be fathers. Children estranged from their fathers. Anyone grieving the death of a father. And fathers who have lost a child. Draw near, Lord, to all for whom this day stirs up difficult emotions. Put in your heart your Holy Spirit. That they would feel your peace. The peace that only you can give, Lord, that Patsy here talked about this morning. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Here we can say intercessions out loud or in our hearts at this time. Lord, thank you for this place where we can come together and worship you. Thank you for the voices of the beautiful choir we have that we heard this morning and for Sue who organizes it for her time, Lord. We were so blessed this morning to hear the music because you tell us to have a joyful heart always and sing to you with a loud voice. Sometimes we sing, Lord, we don't use our mouth, but it comes from our hearts. And we praise you and thank you for that. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For all the saints that have gone before us, we give you thanks. Receive into your eternal care all those who have died. And we think of Joanne Killingbeck. And fill us with your hope that never disappoints us. God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Receive our prayers, O oh Lord, and answer us, O oh God. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the risen Lord Jesus be with you all. And also with you. Let us uh, give thanks for this morning's offering at this time. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts and ourselves and our time and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen.
Let us join together in the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is O Zion Haste, number 668. Announcements. I always want to do that camp song. Announcements, announcements, announcements. Oh, I'm glad I'm not the only one that knows that song. Well, would you like to? <laughs> no, I didn't finish it, Rose, because as I got to that point, the next song that went in my head was from camp, and, and it's you're always behind times, just like the old cow's tail. Um, <laughs> so that wasn't the next line. I knew that. <laughs> okay, summer newsletters going to be July and August combined. So that means you got to think farther ahead and all the information needs to be to the church office by tomorrow. So if you haven't got it there yet, um, you got 24 hours probably. Uh, council meeting has been changed to June 21st, which is Thursday, Amy? 21st is Thursday, right? Wednesday? Wednesday, okay. Sorry, I'm not trying to add to your confusion. <laughs> Faith Alive um, 
next next Sunday. You sure may. Absolutely. Faith Alive says this program. Faith Alive is not a program. I think people understand that. Faith Alive is what the two words say. It's our faith which comes alive with the Lord leading when we have these gatherings. I call them gatherings of all ages. So I don't know how the word program got in it, but it is not a program. It's a God happening in, in our lives when we're together. And I see it all the time, and I know Rose sees it all the time, and all those that are there. So just wanted to make that correction. And that okay. we will not have faith alive for July and August. That's a time for us to pray because God has good things happening, and it will start again in September. Great. That's right. That's right. Sometimes God needs some time of rest to make to help us have that process happen. Um, the Women in Faith, our Bible studies, um, we will be doing a summer series Bible study, and it starts next Monday, a week from tomorrow. We will still be on Zoom at seven o'clock. And um, Joanne, I don't have the Zoom link to you yet because I realized that um, when I went on to get the link to send it yesterday or the day before out, that Zion's Church Council has changed their council meetings and they are now meeting via Zoom in direct conflict to Bible study. So I have reached out to Justina to see if she can give me a, a link from Trinity. And hopefully that will be able to happen and I'll get it out so you can share it with other folks, okay? Um, I was kind of behind because of travel, but I'm more behind now because, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it will. But it, I reached out to her yesterday. It's a weekend. Um, Bible study this Thursday at 10. Um, oh, and if you need a teaser about the Women of Faith Bible study, uh, three months over the summer, June, July, August, we'll be looking at the word now and how that ties with faith. Um, so it looks to be an interesting Bible study. It's the study that's in the Gather magazine, so which is the women of the ELCA magazine. But if you just Google gather.org or gather put type in Gather magazine, their website should come up and you can actually get to the Bible study. Um, you can download it, print it, but I'll send the link out to, to Joanne. But um, if you wanna get a jump start on it, it's not hard for, for finding. Any other additional announcements? Yes. Okay, so Wednesday is Wednesday is feeding day. Uh, I'm helping with the preparing food in the afternoon for the Salvation Army's meal, and also preparing some food for feed my sheep. Okay, one thirty, two o'clock on Wednesday, the twenty first. <laughs> Okay, great. Do you have something to say too? I, I see you ready to get up. Today's the fifth day in Berkeley. The Reformed Church has been on the same site for 300 years. And they're getting a coffee hour from 11 to 12. I remember it. 12 is one. So it's a history lesson of the many things that have happened. And one to three, they like to feed their community with free meals. It's being catered. So come and enjoy and feed their community. 
So leave church, go have coffee with the Reformed Church, learn some history, and by then your coffee will have settled and you'll be even more hungry and you can get free dinner and you can help them celebrate 300 years. That's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, how amazing. Okay, did we catch all the announcements? You're welcome, you're welcome. Okay. Okay. So come to Bible study and stick around for wise that you might be wiser. <laughs> okay. All right. Let us go with God's blessing. The God who calls across the cosmos and speaks in even the smallest seed, bless, keep, and sustain you now and to the end of the age. Amen. Go in peace. Share the harvest. Thanks, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs>